Hey everybody, it's I Am New here. We are talking our way through uh, Luther's Small Catechism. Pastor Richard, what are we doing today? Well, we're covering the uh, fifth and sixth commandments. Yeah, good stuff. So, uh, which I was, when I tell my confirmation students, always what five, they say murder, life, six would be marriage, adultery. I mean, just real simply stated. Right. And this is one where, where you can really, really get lost in the weeds, especially with that sixth commandment, because it, it really sort of seems like as the church would talk about it, it is written only in all of the things that you should not be doing. But Luther is actually really helpful here when he talks about the sixth commandment, and it might even help us filter back to the fifth. The sixth commandment is one of the ones in the explanation. He, refl- he explains only in terms of what is positive, not actually at all in terms of what is negative. That doesn't mean that there aren't negatives. But he says the point of the sixth commandment is that we would fear and love God so that we would have a chaste and decent life in what we say and do husband and wife love and honor each other. And I'm, I'm using an old word here. Uh, I'm using chaste, which is in the old translation, but it's, it's a helpful one because the other stuff gets harder to explain. And we get lost in the weeds, but chastity is simple. Chastity is this, like what if God wanted you to have a healthy, happy marriage, either now or in the future? And the things that would help you have a healthy, happy marriage now or in the future, they are chaste. And the things either now or in the future that would make it harder for you to have a healthy, happy marriage, they are, they are unchaste. Yeah. God loves marriage. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think this is one thing that, uh, at least when I was a kid, you know, thinking through the Ten Commandments, kind of got this perception that, you know, God has these ten rules because he wants to be a killjoy. He wants to be miserable and uh, he doesn't like you very much. And so... <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's like you're a, just not ashamed enough right now. Yeah, it's like it's almost a kind of this picture of that you have a you know cranky parents that just want to stick it to you, and uh, that that could not be further from the truth when it comes to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are wonderful, wonderful gifts to us because God loves us. Now, yeah. now let me let me let me just unpack that so it doesn't sound too squishy per se. Mm. Uh, so God God wants uh, he, He's against anarchy. Uh, anarchy hurts and kills and destroys societies. God is against murder. Um, he, he does right. not want murder. Uh, God is a, you know against adultery. He's against stealing of, of property. He's against also uh, uh, you know gossiping and slandering and then uh, coveting. Well, why? Well, because he wants you to have the gift of authority because there's great what order. He wants you to have the gift of life. Life is a wonderful, beautiful thing. He wants you to have the gift of a good marriage, a healthy marriage, a healthy family. And then he wants you to have the gift of, of, of property and a good reputation and contentment. Uh, God has this wonderful design, per se, of how these good gifts are to flourish among us. And so he says, you know, what? I'm going to put these fences up to protect you because when you don't have these fences up in these things come in, the old Adam, the world, and the devil wreak havoc. It destroys all these things, and it ultimately hurts you. Right. It's, it's a recognition. This is not to get out of something, but it's, it's this. God actually loves your life so much that you're not allowed to hate it and nobody's allowed to take it from you. And that that matters for a couple of reasons, because we can find all the things that we do wrong, and God still looks at it and says, in the midst of, of every awful thing you've ever done, your life matters so much, nobody can take it from you. Nobody's allowed to come kill you. And in the same way, your neighbor's life matters so much so that when you look at somebody and and you you are mad at them either for, for what they represent or what they have done to you, you, you here are actually told to hear, God loves them too in a way that means you cannot harm them, not even in your heart. You cannot hate them either. Yeah. And, and again, that comes back to God wanting to protect life because life is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Uh, it's a wonderful gift. It's a, and, and so, you know, when we look at life itself, uh, we say to ourselves, okay, well, well, how much does God value life? He, he values life to the point of the cross, that he bleeds and dies for us as, as his, his precious creation. And so, again, uh, it's the gift of life itself. And then same thing with the sixth commandment, uh, the gift of marriage. Uh, God wants all of us to have great marriages, uh, which has a context of a great family. And so then he says, you know what, I'm gonna put these roadblocks up to what, you know, don't commit adultery. Uh, these things, because they can what? They can destroy and wreak havoc on a marriage. And then not only does it wreak havoc on a marriage, but it can wreak havoc on the children and divorce and all this other stuff that goes with it. And marriage is a gift, uh, just like life. And God wants us to have that. Right. And 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 sort of from that, it, it, it lets us start to deal with uh, both the internals and the externals of it. Um, this this starts out with, again, a, a, a law that actually defines the lawgiver more than it defines us as as the law followers, uh, because all of us have have held even in our hearts uh, a, a hatred for somebody. It's, it's something we struggle with. And God here says this is something that has to die on a cross. Uh, everybody uh, has, has sort of recognized in, inside of this something in their life that is either now or in the future 
done damage to a marriage uh, from websites that you visit to to thoughts that you have about the opposite gender to to actions that are taken and that is something that has to die on a cross and it, it also helps shape the law here especially in a very concrete way in that the law the law paints a picture of Jesus not of you the, the law paints exactly who your God is, what he's like and what he does. And you you do your best to follow that. You do your best to emulate that. But it is fulfilled in Christ. And so when you look at this, you're allowed to look at it in a way that colors you a sinner because you also have a savior. Yeah. And so I can't agree anymore. I mean, this, you're spot on, Harrison. You know, so when we look at the law, uh, we look at the law and, and we look at it and we say, man, this is this is beautiful. This is good. To, to uphold life, to uphold marriage, to uphold uh, authority in a sense that it doesn't lead to anarchy, to uphold a good, good reputation and so forth. All of this is good. And we can, on the one hand, we can say, this is really good. This is wonderful. And on the other hand, when we look at that goodness, I am say, not. I'm not good. I mean, I have hated in my heart. I've lusted in my heart. Um, I have I have a rebellious nature towards uh, those in authority. Um, mm-hmm. I gossip, I slander, I do all these things. And so... This goes back to the whole Romans 7 thing, right? The Apostle Paul, the very good that I want to do. We can say, that's really, really good. These Ten Commandments are really, really good. They're awesome. They're wonderful. We will ponder them. We'll read them. We'll preach them. We'll teach them. We'll ponder them. Again, all this, the Ten Commandments are so good. And yet I'm so bad. I fail so much, which then brings us back to the one who is perfect in upholding that law, Jesus. And we say, Lord God, forgive me. And then we can confess like David, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me so that I might, what, walk in these good Ten Commandments uh, that are good for me, and as you mentioned earlier, good for our neighbors as well. I mean, that's that's the beautiful thing, is that these Ten Commandments not only bless us, but they bless our neighbors. And so, again, repentance is nothing more than just, I don't meet up to it, forgive me, cleanse me, and, uh, you know, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me that I may what, walk in these divine truths. Yeah. And, and there you're defining repentance, not just as contrition, but also as hope. Uh, and, and that matters. Uh, it, it, it is a, a recognition that when I look at myself in the light of the Ten Commandments, I definitely don't measure up. But it's more than just sort of being sad your way into to the resurrection. But, but rather, I also hope that God will create in me a clean heart of God, that, that he does, in fact, renew me day by day to, to live before him in righteousness and purity forever. It, it's both parts. Yeah. And, and I would say that the, all of our life, uh, we never grow tired of studying the Ten Commandments because, you know, our sinful nature is going to play all sorts of games. You know, did God really say, right? And, and is this really this? And that's why we constantly need to be studying God's law, constantly be studying it and constantly repenting at the same time and constantly abiding in Jesus. And so it is a continuation of our whole life, um, abiding in his word, trusting in his word, uh, hearing his law, hearing his gospel. Um, all the way through life until the very end, uh, until when he takes us home, makes all things right. I love it. Pastor, thanks.